The date is early 2021, and cross-strait relations between Taiwan and China are at a crisis point. The new incoming American president has resumed full-scale arms sales to Taiwan and publicly declared America's military support for the island democracy. For the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing, this is unacceptable. Not only is Taiwan a renegade province in their eyes, but the entire party knows that the continued existence and prosperity of this small breakaway democracy on their doorstep is a fatal threat to their power. Already disgruntled Chinese youth are calling for more civil liberties, like their cousins in Taiwan enjoy. The Chinese hope to capitalize on the chaos in Washington as the new president replaces the outgoing president and make preparations to at last do what they've promised to do for decades, reunification by force. The outlook is grim. China's defense budget is a staggering $237 billion versus Taiwan's meager $10 billion. The Chinese military numbers at just over 2 million, with Taiwan's own numbering at 165,000. What hope does this small island nation have? Chinese military planners begin the process of preparing for an invasion. There are only two short four-week windows throughout the year when an invasion across the tumultuous Taiwanese Strait is possible, April and October. Any other time of the year, an invasion would simply be unfeasible. The weather and sea conditions are too unstable. The Chinese immediately begin mobilizing their eastern and southern military districts, and PLA conscripts are put through a crash three-week amphibious warfare course. But there are problems before the invasion even begins. The biggest problem is the lack of a suitable amphibious assault fleet. China has only 22 small landing ships and 37 amphibious transport docks, each of which can carry around four tanks or armored vehicles and two infantry companies. The number of available vessels is reduced even further when three of China's Type 71 amphibious transport dock ships are severely damaged by saboteurs. The war may not have started yet, but Taiwan's vast number of intelligence agents and special operations forces are already at work on the mainland. China will need at least half a million soldiers for the invasion to succeed. And with such a limited mobility fleet, the government immediately begins to press merchant marine and civilian vessels into military service. Troops, equipment, and large numbers of the People's Liberation Army rocket forces must be maneuvered into place for the attack, giving Taiwan a 60-day head start on preparing for the invasion. With so much manpower and firepower being moved around, keeping the invasion secret is completely impossible. Taiwanese saboteurs continue complicating matters for the Chinese. A propaganda campaign hits mainland China, warning of the great cost in human lives that the invasion will incur. While some of the younger Chinese population is disturbed by the prospect of invasion, the older Chinese population has been told for decades that the Chinese military could easily crush any Taiwanese resistance. The effect of the propaganda campaign barely affects the invasion plans. Other Taiwanese operations, however, are far more effective. Special forces ambush and assassinate several high-ranking People's Liberation Army officers, as well as key politicians. The morale of the Chinese military is rocked as the realization that Taiwan can strike so deep into the the mainland hits the mostly conscripted troops. Taiwanese saboteurs destroy several railways, highway bridges, and power plants across the nation, causing massive delays in moving troops and equipment to the staging areas. The Chinese economy takes a small dive as jittery investors sell stock and hoard capital in anticipation of a worsening situation. Across the strait, however, Chinese agents are also busy at work. The Chinese don't blow up bridges and rail lines, as the Taiwanese are already prepared to do that themselves as they fight a defensive retreat from the landing beaches. Instead, Chinese special forces and undercover operatives strike at Taiwanese military and civilian leadership. Several Taiwanese generals are killed, as well as some low-ranking government officials. However, Taiwan has long prepared for exactly this scenario, and their security measures are extremely robust. Taiwanese civilians, however, aren't so well protected, and several prominent pro-independent celebrities and activists are all murdered by Chinese agents. China's willingness to kill civilians, though, only further emboldens the Taiwanese defenders. They will not be ruled by the CCP. April and its calmer weather finally arrives, and the Chinese invasion begins. The opening act of the Chinese operation to reunify Taiwan is the greatest missile strike in human history. China maintains one of the world's largest arsenals of non-nuclear ballistic and land-sea attack missiles, operated by the PLARF, its military service dedicated to missile combat. Hundreds of missiles streak out across the Taiwan Strait in the opening salvo, 
each one aimed at a predetermined target chosen years before as new invasion plans are drafted and updated. Power plants, government buildings, military airfields and installations are all saturated with missile strikes. And after several waves of hundreds of missiles each, every civilian and military airfield on the island has been cratered. Every government building has been destroyed, and the only working power plants are over the mountains on the east side of the island, which are more difficult to hit. Yet Taiwan has its own missiles, and it responds with a lesser volume but no less lethal attack. Taiwan's missiles are aimed at the invasion staging areas, decimating troops waiting to board their landing ships and hitting many of the most forward airfields. Radar and communications nodes along the east coast of China are targeted, and dozens are destroyed by Taiwanese cruise missiles. The real cost of a Taiwan invasion is starting to sink in for the troops even now putting out to the sea. Screaming over the heads of soldiers sailing to Taiwan are hundreds of Chinese fighters and bombers. Though Taiwan's airfields have been devastated, the country has planned for this too, and its fighters have been for a long time safely housed in mountain bunkers capable of withstanding a nuclear attack. Highways are turned into airfields, and Taiwan's fighters take to the air to meet the teeth of the Chinese attack. Taiwan holds its fighters safely shielded from targeting and detection behind the mountains that run along the middle of the island. This is a major problem for China's own fighters, who are forced to seek out the Taiwanese-American-made F-16s and indigenously-made FCK-1Cs. As they cross the west of Taiwan, road mobile air defenses too agile to be targeted by missile strikes light up the Chinese planes, as Taiwan's air forces ambush the Chinese from behind the mountain. The initial sorties are overwhelmingly in Taiwan's favor, but China has over 1,200 combat aircraft, Taiwan only has 289. Not all of China's air force can be deployed, however, both because of logistical issues and because of a lack of suitable airfields near enough the conflict zone. This levels the playing field somewhat, but China still has a sizable numbers advantage. The Taiwanese defenders fight valiantly in the air, but they're forced to pick their fights and can't defend every military unit under air attack. Thousands of ships steam across the Taiwanese Strait. Most are civilian vessels, very poorly suited for amphibious operations of any kind. Only a few are proper amphibious assault ships. The landing fleet is escorted by Chinese destroyers and guided missile cruisers, who are busily searching the waterway for a deadly threat. Anti-submarine warfare, however, is something the People's Liberation Army Navy is extremely poorly equipped to undertake. All four of Taiwan's submarines have been dedicated to this fight. Now they lurk under predetermined positions in very deep waters, barely making a noise. Even for a foe with sophisticated undersea capabilities, they would be an extremely difficult foe to find and destroy as they sit silently waiting in ambush. The subs don't have to move, they must simply let the invasion fleet come to them. Once within range, they open up with American-made torpedoes, sinking several of the larger ships. Each Taiwanese submariner knows that they are the first line of defense for their homeland, and retreat is not an option until their full complement of torpedoes has been fired. The first wave of the invasion fleet is rocked by dozens of torpedo attacks, but at last Chinese subs manage to track and destroy two of the Taiwanese boats, with the other two finally fleeing after expending their entire inventory of munitions. The invasion fleet is still dozens of miles away from the Taiwanese coast, and already thousands of Chinese soldiers and sailors are dead. Morale amongst the tens of thousands of conscripts, either out at sea or waiting their turn to embark, starts to plummet. This was supposed to be an easy war. The fleet moves to within two dozen miles of Taiwan when suddenly the lead ship in the formation explodes and begins to sink. Another ship quickly follows and then a third. With growing horror, the Chinese sailors realize they've sailed straight into a vast minefield created by the Taiwanese Navy over two weeks ago in preparation for the invasion. Thousands of sea mines have been dispersed over a 60-mile stretch of ocean, and despite hundreds of Chinese minesweepers, sea mines are amongst the most difficult weapons to detect and destroy. More explosions rock the fleet, though this time not from mines. Now it's air-launched cruise missiles launched by Taiwan's Air Force, held in reserve until exactly this time. With Taiwan's shores in sight, less than half of the first invasion wave is still intact. The rest has either been sunk or forced to break off and return to port. The fact that most of these vessels are civilian ships with civilian crews pressed into service only makes things worse for China. 
There are only 13 suitable landing beaches for an invasion of Taiwan, and the nation has taken extensive measures to defend them. As the first wave of landing craft makes for shore, the ships are immediately opened up on by shore defenses. Despite round after round of missile and air attack, Taiwan's beach defenses are built to last, consisting of deep reinforced tunnels that shelter infantry and allow them to move freely and underground supply depots. Chinese air attack was also supposed to take out most of Taiwan's artillery, anti-tank guns, and combat tanks. But with thousands of decoys built and spread around the island, only about a third of Taiwan's heavy equipment has been destroyed by China's air force. Inevitably, though, some of the landing craft make their way to shore, only to be immediately met by a wall of fire. Buried under its 13 probable landing sites, Taiwan has built long oil pipelines which discharge thousands of gallons of oil into the water, which is then ignited. Flames consume landing ships and scores of men die or jump into the oil slick water, drowning from the weight of all their combat equipment. At last, the first wave manages to make landfall though, and men rush to find defensible positions from which to assault the Taiwanese defenders. Except there are no defensible positions. The beaches have been closed to the public for weeks and stripped bare of any defensible features. Hills have been leveled with heavy equipment and strands of trees toppled. What meets the Chinese invaders is a moonscape of sand and rock and thousands of mines and booby traps. Razor wire snares entangle the feet of advancing soldiers. Boards full of sharp hooks lie buried under a thin layer of sand. Planks embedded with razor sharp bits of metal await anyone unwary enough or unlucky enough to step or crawl on one, shredding the skin to the bone. Spike trips and pitfall traps only add to the overwhelming dangers awaiting the Chinese on the beach. Chinese forces have only one option. Cross a mile of booby traps and minefields, or get decimated on the beaches by Taiwanese artillery. The beaches are hell for Chinese soldiers, but their armored vehicles are faring little better. The few that manage to make it to shore face anti-vehicle mines and tank traps, as well as a robust number of anti-tank weapons now wielded by 1.6 million Taiwanese reservists. The long preparation time for the invasion by the Chinese forces has been put to good use by Taiwan, which recalled its massive reservist forces over a month ago and immediately began training to resist the invasion. The second wave is rushed across the strait, as the first is dangerously close to being pushed back out to sea by the defenders. The rush sees many ships stray into mines, however, despite the safety lanes carefully cleared out by the Chinese minesweepers. Despite the tight lid that the Chinese leadership is keeping on the casualties being suffered by the invasion fleet, rumors are spreading rapidly, and the morale of China's conscript forces is already hitting new lows. They were promised a swift victory against an inferior enemy. Taiwan is proving to be stubbornly resistant and far from inferior to the mainland forces. In fact, the training received by Taiwan's officers from American instructors has helped shape Taiwan's forces into an extremely capable force. The People's Liberation Army, however, is faring far worse. While Taiwan has had the advantage of close cooperation and training with American combat veteran instructors, the People's Liberation Army has not fought in a major conflict since it was defeated by Vietnam in 1979 during a short-lived border war. While China claimed victory, it failed in its objective to remove Vietnam from Cambodia, and outside observers all agreed that Vietnam had outperformed China. Since 1979, the Chinese military has been plagued by corruption, and despite President Xi Jinping's anti-corruption efforts, the Chinese military remains rife with ineffectual officers. Low morale amongst its overwhelmingly conscript force is also a critical concern, as is the very poor and unrealistic training of its military forces. The lack of experience in modern combat and an officer corps still suffering the effects of decades of corruption all add up to a strategic disaster in Taiwan. Despite managing to at last make landfall with the majority of its invasion fleet, the PLA's inexperience creates a logistical disaster. Add to that the tens of thousands of booby traps meant to destroy tanks, helicopters, and men, as well as the mining and demolition of every strategically important roadway and bridge, and China's military is running into extreme difficulties coordinating its forces for cohesive action. Taiwan takes full advantage of the confusion and wages a merciless guerrilla warfare campaign against the invaders. With dozens of miles of swampy marshlands between its forces and all of the most important strategic objectives, China's forces are being bled dry. By the end of the first week, casualties are sky high and morale is plunging across the Chinese military. Political will for the invasion is evaporating as the human and economic costs begin to ramp up. 
and civil unrest quickly follows as angry Chinese citizens realize that they were lied to for decades about the quick victory over Taiwan they were always promised. And that's when the first of three American Pacific Carrier Strike Groups arrive 100 miles off Taiwan's coast, reinforced by an entire US Marine and a Japanese Self-Defense Forces Expeditionary Force.